Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bright Founders Talk at Temi. Temi is an international software development company that designs, builds, and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. My name is Matthew, and I'm joined today by Mr. Itai Amoze, who is the uh, co founder and CEO of a company called StoryDoc. How are you today, Itai? Uh, doing great. Thank you. Happy to be here. Fantastic. Itai, before we get started, can you tell our viewers and our listeners a little bit about StoryDoc and your role within the company? Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I'm actually one of the, the founders here at StoryDoc. We actually kind of started almost four years ago. Um, and what the, what the company does is basically we're developing a, a tool, and a platform for uh, sales and marketing professionals to create engaging and interactive business documents. So what it eventually means that it makes it extremely simple uh, and easy to, uh, to to turn from static PDFs like uh, materials such as brochures, sales presentations, even long form reports, where the tool kind of makes them uh, um, easy to follow, engaging, interactive, have a lot of video materials and, and live data. Uh, and at the end of the day, that just kind of makes, the, makes the, the, the impact of those documents just much more powerful when they are actually being used. Okay, it sounds like there's a lot of technical things involved there. What I'd like to do is take it a few steps back and let's start about the beginning. <laughs> no, not so much, not so much. Is it okay? Not too bad. We'll get a bit into it. Um, but tell us about where it was born. Where did the idea come from? Uh, actually, it happened to me in a, in, in a business trip. Like I'm, I'm originally a, a data geek more than anything else. And in my previous, uh, in my previous company, I was actually tasked with um, and dealing with anything that has to do with uh, sales and marketing to very big enterprises in the UK, actually. So we were uh, selling different um, uh, partnerships to, uh, to you know, UK's kind of biggest consumer brands. So imagine what it means to get Tesco or Sainsbury's excited or, I don't know, anyone on Argos to kind of pay attention to you. So it was always a struggle to kind of get them uh, interested and excited beyond some initial touch points. And I was always feeling that, you know, being in, in, in a meeting, I was able to tell the story of the company or the story of why you want to partner with us or what's going to happen after we get started. But then it always ended up with that sort of magical sentence of, OK, great, but send me your slides uh, we'll have a look at it. Uh, we'll have a chat. We'll get back to you. We'll see how it goes. Uh, and that was always the moment that I, I knew that I have to, you know, book another flight to London and basically try and, and meet them again because nothing is going to happen with my slides or with that collateral I'm going to leave behind. So actually, that's the, the, after those kind of types of frustrations, I kept sort of thinking of how can I get, you know, the other side easily see, um, you know, uh, why they want to move forward while they're debating internally. So I've actually experimented with like different things. Like I was trying like different dashboards, uh, even tried to, you know, to um, to build out like more engaging decks on PowerPoint. Um, but then at one point, I just kind of, I realized that uh, that the biggest problem is that people just don't bother even reading them. And moreover, they actually open it up on mobile first. Like you'd be, you'd be surprised even today, just how many of, you know, like the um, in documents or business documents are just opened up on mobile. And I don't know if you ever tried, Matt, to kind of open a, power, a PowerPoint on your phone, but uh, that's not the easiest of, um, of things to do. No. And that's where sort of it hit me that I, I need something else. Um, and then that's where I'm kind of partnered with, uh, with the other co-founders. And we started experimenting and finding different ways. Of how, how do you get to that moment where someone is going to open it up? Uh, it's clearly boring. It's going to be, I don't know, a long proposal or a very detailed document or a presentation. So they obviously don't want to now start reading. Like it almost feels like homework, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So how can we make this appealing, engaging, and inviting? Yeah, and that one thing led to another, but that's that's what you know we do to this day, sort of making that moment from a dead end in your process into something that actually moves the deal forward. And tell me a little bit about what it was like for you finding um, other founders and then obviously getting this idea going, starting it up, um, finding funding, and all of that. Yeah, so it's, uh, I'll be honest to every other founder kind of listening to it, um, like founding founders might be the hardest and a part of every new, um, you know, every new startup or every new business. Uh, it is literally just like marriage in many ways and um, that you have to get along. Uh, 
you sort of, you know, you need to be, this other person needs to be what you want, but you need to be what they want as well. And maybe also like you really need to work on your relationship as well. So it's, uh, so it's, it's not an easy, like it's not the easiest thing. Uh, I have two other founders with me. Um, one of them, we actually know each other for 15 years. We kind of used to work together and he is our creative mind kind of and presentation designer. And actually when, where we used to work before, he was the actual person making a lot of the more kind of complicated high-end presentations. So he was honestly my first call, phone call when I knew that I need someone to kind of help me out with how I do kind of business storytelling. How can I visually, you know, um, you know, uh, tell a story of something that is inherently complicated or boring or uh, or not that exciting? And that's that. The two of us kind of started sort of working on like different ideas and and examples. Um, and then like along the line, we've also added a third co-founder, which is uh, our CTO, like the technology side. And that was more like uh, like dating, to be honest. If again we, we continue with that uh, sort of uh, dating analogy, because like we kind of we tried to work with you know different people, got like you know either introductions or different events, and so on. Ended up uh, falling in love, and things went on smoothly from there. But it was a I don't know like a thorough process. Like we knew that we don't want to get jump into bed too quickly, uh, because it is a very hard thing to sort. If you got if you got it wrong for some reason, it, it can really kill your company at the beginning. So we did take it slow at the beginning. We kind of worked unofficially for uh, for a couple of months, kind of did some sort of proof of concepts and things, but mainly to kind of see that uh, that we're on the same page. And once we realized this is this is it, that's where we kind of sat down and really kind of started building the the plan moving forward. The way you've explained it will make it. Uh... A lot easier for a lot of us to understand. We've been in the dating game. We know some of the struggles, but it's good. So you've gotten to that point then um, where you're comfortable. You've got people around you that you can trust. And um, tell us a little bit about um, finding funding. Yeah. So uh, so funding is is again a tricky a tricky thing, in, especially in the early stage, because it's always like a delicate balance between uh, you know always getting more traction or more confidence. From you can always be, you can always sort of progress and, and I don't know, let's get another client or let's get a proof of concept running or let's develop another feature. And that's when they will see that we're investment worthy. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, uh, you do want to create some sort of a compelling event for investors to jump in. So so for us, it was always like that sort of working on, working on those two aisles in parallel. So on one hand, all, like we've been in touch with uh, you know, for investors or like potential partners pretty much from day zero. So when it was only a, an idea um, and in parallel, once we kind of got in more and more traction, we got our first paying customers or, you know, our first kind of people seeing value. It then became easier to sort of turn it into um, an investment opportunity. But I would always kind of say that the, the secret was to do it in parallel. Like just, it's never a good time to start fundraising. And then the other side, it's also not great to just keep sort of building and building without testing the water. And in fact, what you know, what investors like at these stages is mainly the team and you know your ability to turn ideas to like an actual outcome out there. So the fact that they were able to meet you when you had an idea, and then when you had some initial conversations, and then when you had your first POC, and then when you had your first client, like what they really look for in most cases is that exact exact sort of evolution. Mm. So they could feel comfy when you were basically promising them even more evolution for years to come, sort of. So um, so it, it took us like a few good months. It was actually uh, during COVID, so not the easiest of times to fundraise. But we've ended up like, uh, yeah, with like great, great, in, you know, investors that are working with us to this day, like actively in, you know, in building the company. Fantastic. And um, the company is now uh, multinational. Um, tell us a little bit about how you've spread, how you've, um, ad- navigated the challenges of moving in in different markets in different countries yeah so so honestly for us it was always you know global like coming out of israel like the, the local market uh, is not is never big enough to, you know to host a proper sort of product technology company so we were always sort of looking into the outside and when we started the whole idea was to say like we had like a couple of assumptions maybe one is that this would actually bring true value for you know for the cost for customers 
And second, that we will be able to make it globally uh, in an affordable way. I'm, and I'm speaking slightly before COVID really hit. It became very normal to, you know, to do business on Zoom or communicate on Zoom and and so on. And, and you know, even sign documents uh, online. Mm-hmm. So it was really crucial for us to know that we have a good idea at hand to see that we can get, you know, we can, we can, we can get customers from day one that are, you know, uh, that we never met physically. And second, that we can get people to automatically just buy online. So the, both those both sides, like so having like a strong self-serve option, uh, because that's where you can really, you can't fake it as a founder at the beginning. Like if you're trying to sell to your mates or maybe past contact, you can always give them a call. You can always sort of try and solve some problems that are preventing them from, you know, uh, seeing value or moving forward, which is okay at the beginning. But the true sort of, you know, um, proof is when someone that you never met, never heard of you, just went online, uh, liked what they saw and swiped their credit card. So so for us, that was like, that was very important. And the way we've done it was uh, even from among our f- first five clients, I believe that at least a couple of them were outside of, of Israel. So um, Europe, and, and the US. Uh, and even as of now, like our main kind of marketing channels and so on are very tailored to uh, uh, to go globally in terms of like US and Europe mainly. But uh, but today it's exciting. You have story docs in like pretty much every every place. Like so in Japanese, in Arabic, there's even one from Fiji that I've seen not long ago from our community. So it's quite, quite exciting to see just how far it can go. So to see something of yours that's grown like that, it must give you um, a sense of pride and accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. When you have the moment to kind of contemplate, yes. Um, but I'll, I'll be honest and say that in you know this is still at least we see this still as a relatively early stage. It's not just like being humble. It's just like at these phases, we already have like a very solid uh, you know um, uh, solution at hand and a lot of impressive customers, and yet there's still a lot to kind of to be done. So, so I, I would be honest and say that it's not the easiest to not kind of focus on, you know, the, the thing that you know that you want to make better. And, and yeah, when you have a moment to kind of try and, uh, and sort of just realize, realize what have you, what have you've made, but it's not easy. Like, uh, we, we have like a little, uh, uh, ceremony, we call it like celebrating success. So I don't know if you have a, like a, a, a new buyer from a country that we never had before, or that like small little kind of nuggets that kind of make sort of, you know, kind of help you kind of realize just like how far it, it went. Yeah. Um, talking about building things, what about uh, the people around you, the employees of StoryDocs? Like, how do you go about choosing the right people, building a team? What values do you look for? Yeah, so uh, honestly for us, even um, before anything else, like we kind of decided to, to sort of, you know, t- thanks to COVID, if you want to call it this way, that's when we actually sat down to build the team. So we we kind of took a pretty hard decision uh, that wasn't obvious back then to kind of do it completely remote. So build the team essentially with anyone that want to work roughly in our time zone. So South Africa included. Uh, so like roughly kind of in the EU time zone is is legit. And that that's that that became I think a, a major part of like the company culture. So we had to sort of solve a lot of things in the way people can communicate, collaborate, how you can make people feel part of the team, even though um, they're very distant. And, you know, in the first like, almost year, uh, we even never met each other because it was all the different kind of COVID uh, regulations and, and, and limitations. So we sort of had to kind of make it work with, uh, with those values in mind. So it kind of came in the fact that we, we've learned that we really value people that are on one side independent and and want to have complete freedom in the way they manage their time and energy but you also don't have to sort of micromanage manage them it might work in an office but being completely remote it just doesn't even remotely works and the second thing is that while they are very independent also great at communication like the, the chances of misunderstanding of even hurting someone's feeling of you know coming out wrong over emails or like short text messages is big uh, so like also really, really optimizing for people that, that you know, that, that are good communicators as much as possible. Yeah. So I would say both, both too. And, and then, and, and you need bright people. Like, like it's almost impossible when you are a small company, like if you don't have like even mediocre folks are just not gonna, not gonna make it. 
because everything is organized, like everything is so wide and unbaked just yet that if you just don't have people that are truly great, it's just not gonna not gonna materialize. It's good advice. Um, I had to have a chuckle there about the miscommunication in emails. I tend to overutilize emojis just to get the point across, you know, so people know, hey, things are okay, a little thumbs up. <laughs> um, I tell you, yeah, and I, I got to say that one of the things that, that, that was really cool for us was uh, that we kind of discovered late, but then became significant is all the voice messages and like WhatsApp or Slack. Uh, like that that's, is surprisingly effective. So it's not as... Because it sort of mimics the uh, the experience of just walking to someone on, in the office and asking a quick question. Like, I'm not sending you an invite. We're not scheduling a Zoom. It's or but it's also not. I'm not texting you and like not writing an email or just texting you. So we kind of found it as a as a good sort of in between where you can just like record one minute of like you know, hey Matt, quick question about blah blah blah, and it feels less formal, but also mm-hmm. like you do you are able to sort of give the right tone of voice and context because it's still audio and not not text. Yes. So yeah, if, if if anyone is feeling the same with their company, maybe uh, give it a try. Like we we like the uh, the option. Absolutely. Oh, fantastic. Um, you're talking about our interactions with people and giving off the right uh, sort of vibes. It's I, are, you a, are you a family man? Do you have family at home? Uh, yeah, uh, married and one, one little uh, uh, kid at home. Terrific. And, um, Cute and crazy all at, one, all at once. How do you, how do you find, um, I don't want to call it a balance, but how do you ensure that you have the right energies in the right places between your family, your children, your business. Yeah, so I think I think it's a it's a great question, and if you know, anyone knows the answer, I'll be the first one kind of uh, in line, like kind of looking for a, for a good advice. I think in general, maybe like maybe regardless of family or not family, like uh, I, I think it's extremely hard, especially as an early stage founder, but also like later to find balance. Like the one of the things that the, the, once you stop being a hired gun and it becomes your company, um, like it, it, you, it's not that easy. It's not as easy to walk away from work, especially at the beginning, where everything is so fragile. And if you miss out on an important deal, or you miss out on an important hire, or you missed out on an, an important release, like whatever, it might really make a, a significant damage. Like when you work in a more established, uh, safer place then you know you can always wait for next week or for tomorrow and probably nothing's going to happen but it's honestly not the case in in very early stage startups so uh, so sometimes you just can't kind of manage the balance and it boils down to you know making trade offs or either on your sort of you know ability to sleep or your time for family or you know dropping some balls in the at work like but it's uh, but I, I like I, honestly there's no magic tricks here like it, it's it's a it's sort of a devil's dilemma in many cases, uh, so there's like yeah, there were endless weekends and nights that we kind of had to sit down and and you know and push hard just for this not to fall apart. Yes. Um, but on the other side, the the tip I can give is uh, at some point you're not fighting for your life every day. Like at the beginning, yes, but then when things start to stabilize, like every founder I've ever met, myself included, always sort of stops stops being in that war mode too late and then you're sometimes over exhausted before you start um you know picking up yourself and realizing this is this is a marathon and not a sprint mm-hmm. so um so it's very hard to say when exactly is that time but uh but as soon as you can you can do like you can put some you know uh, reasonable sort of barriers be- barriers between like how much you work and when to your family time and and just rest time like you don't have to have a family to not to not overburn yourself like what I do, for example, is I just found that the only way I can actually uh, make sure I do it is just like lock in sometimes in the morning, for example, to do some sports or lock in some time in the afternoon to be with my kid. And that's once it's in the calendar, that's sort of my way to kind of remind myself that this is this is the time to do it. So I don't know, again, if that's a good tip for everyone, but that's the one I, I found. That's terrific. Um, I like that. I, I use my calendar as well for everything, uh, partly because I'll forget. But also, as you say, to keep a little bit of balance, <laughs> and I oh, don't forget to tell the girlfriend that she's beautiful. And so, you know, happy wife, happy life. And it keeps us all in <laughs> and Before I go, is there anything um, that we may have missed? Anything you'd like to tell the viewers maybe about where they can find Story Dogs 
or anything you think might be important? Yeah, sure. So maybe like uh, we can, the easiest is with with StoryDoc. Um, just go go online. It's very easy to find us. Like go to storydoc.com for anyone that needs uh, you know any, any impressive pitch deck or presentation. Uh, there's an entire section for founders with like great uh, investor um, a template for anything that you need in terms of uh, early stage sort of um, uh, pitch decks and, and examples. Uh, another way to kind of get more insight is following us on LinkedIn. Again, StoryDoc, we do post a lot of high quality content um, and a lot of research that we do on what makes a presentation effective, how to pitch in the best way possible and so on. And with, you know, the, that aside, I can say like for any kind of founders thinking about, um, about starting a new, a new business is uh, just not jump too quickly to developing too many features. I think that's, that's a mistake that, you know, we've done and many others did as well. Uh, like really try and, and back before running to, to code, actually try and, and secure some actual customers, some actual interest, like something out there that means that not only you think it's a great idea, and that's a great way not to overburning yourself too quickly. Uh, like Because if you're working hard in the wrong direction, it's almost impossible to get the positive and kind of honeymoon period of any founding team back. So you only have like one or two shots to, you know, really find something meaningful at the beginning. So yeah, so I would, uh, that would be my maybe like one thing to kind of, for people to kind of take home. Nice. It's all right. Thank you. I, I, I love it. We've had marriage, dating, and honeymoon periods. So a lot of little... Yeah, we're consistent with the, uh, <laughs> with the analogy. Absolutely. Um, so I just want to thank you um, from us as well uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we appreciate your insights. We'll be keeping our eye on you and, and wishing you all the best um, for the future. Awesome. So yeah, pleasure. Thanks for having me.